Hi, y'all. We're back again today for more uh, lessons on how Jesus taught the importance of honoring women, but he never limited women's roles to wife and mother. Last week, we saw how Mary of Bethany, as you will recall, is the sister of Martha and Lazarus, and she took the place of a disciple by sitting at the feet of Jesus, the teacher which was an unusual place for a woman in the first century Judaism to be accepted by a teacher as a disciple. Also, you remember, she poured a pint of very expensive perfume on Jesus' head and feet and wiped them with her hair. So if we, like Mary of Bethany, make sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening to him our priority, we will have her depth of understanding, her passion for Christ, and her complete faith in his plan for our lives. Also, we saw Jesus' interaction with the woman caught in adultery, which was called the Pericope Adultere. By applying the law of Moses, Jesus turned the table in this drama, taking the focus of the mob action and, chained, and the charge against the woman and placing the responsibility square on the accusers. If they were found to be a false witness upon cross-examination, they would be given the same penalty as the accused would have suffered, death by stoning. This message of mercy and forgiveness balanced with a call to holy living has endured in Christian thought. The phrases, let him who is without sin cast the first stone and go and sin no more, have found their way into common usage. Jesus' mastery and argument of the scriptures was on full display here. As his followers, we are challenged to know the scriptures and to be able to apply them to situations of everyday life. Then we had the parable of the unjust judge, which was also the parable of the persistent widow. A judge who lacked compassion repeatedly was approached by a poor widow who was seeking justice. The widow is not asking for any advantage. She was seeking justice. The judge is the exact opposite of what we know to be the two greatest commandments, loving God and loving your neighbor. Ultimately, the widow had success because of her persistence. The lesson here, we lose heart because we don't understand God's timing or purpose or the importance of persistence in prayer. Never giving up. When you stop believing that your prayer will be answered, you stop praying. You give up hope and then you have no faith. We also saw Peter's mother-in-law who Jesus healed of a grave illness and she arose and served him. The widow of Nian was burying her only son when Jesus intercepted the funeral procession, and restored her son's life. Jesus encounters these insignificant women, and it represents the essence of the Savior's personalized ministry and how he reached out to the discouraged common people of society. This firmly settles the issue about whether God knows us and cares about us. Today, we see more women who Jesus encountered. First question, did Jesus honor his mother? Do you remember what he said from the cross before he died? So we start with the blessedness that Jesus offers women. We, society, have a misconception of a, quote, perfect life, which is a belief that a woman's calling is to become a wife and mother. Everything else is secondary. Back in the day, Young women went to college not so much for a degree and a career, but for a MRS degree and a housekeeping career. Jesus changes that perception by his radical statements about women. Jesus changed the concept that women are not blessed when she becomes a wife and mother in her life, but she is truly blessed when she hears and obeys his word. The second thing Jesus came to change was whether or not you are male or female, it is a person's ultimate purpose in life to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Perhaps because of conditioning, women believe 
that we are defined by the success of our children's lives or the status of our husband. Many women falsely believe that they have somehow failed in life or in an aspect of their identity is damaged because their children failed to measure up to lofty standards. As in the patriarchal culture, Mary, Jesus' mother, we presume because Joseph was not mentioned in the later parts of the New Testament, that she faced the death of Joseph sometime in the story of the New Testament. In addition, the worst possible shame in her culture happened when Jesus was crucified as a common criminal. When Jesus was on the cross, no voice cried out, Blessed is the mother who gave birth to you and nursed you, which was what a woman in a crowd called out to Jesus in the parable of the unclean spirits in Luke 11:27. If that had happened, it might have destroyed her identity as well as the family of Mary and Joseph if that was the measure of her purpose. Mary was a daughter of Eve and Azer. Just as Eve, she was created as God's image bearer. From the time she was a child to the end of her life, Mary was called to be a disciple of Jesus. Jesus came to save all, including his mother. Throughout her life, Mary was a hearer and doer of God's word. When the angel appeared and told her that she would be the mother of the Savior, her response was, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her in Luke 1, 38. Her response is a demonstration of the courage and power of a woman who will risk everything to advance God's cause. Are you surprised? Jesus' mother Mary was an Azer. Now we move on to the story of the daughter of Jairus and overlapping the unclean woman who had an issue of blood. Um, I'm going to read from Mark 5, 35 through 43 with a lot of side notes. This came out a little different than our uh, passages before. So while he was still talking, some people came from the leader's house and told him, your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? My question is, does that relate to our negative thinking? I can't bother Jesus with my problems. I'm not good enough, or my sins are so egregious that I cannot approach the throne of grace. Jesus overheard what they were talking about and said to the leader, don't listen to them, trust me. So is this evidence of our lack of faith? Jairus trusted Jesus. Verse 37, he permitted no one to go in with him except Peter, James, and John. They entered the leader's house and pushed their way through the gossips looking for a story and neighbors bringing in casseroles. Why? Jesus had authority and he was asked by Jairus to come to his home. Jesus was abrupt. Why all this busybody grief and gossip? This child isn't dead. She is sleeping. So these people are participating in useless activity. We run around in circles all day, every day, spending a lot of energy on nothing. So perhaps the visitors should have been in prayer. Provoked to sarcasm, he told, they told him he didn't know what he was talking about. But when he had sent them all out, he took the child's father and mother along with his companions and entered the child's room. Why did Jesus send away these unbelievers? And why were they unbelievers? And what is going to happen to these non-believers? He clasped the girl's hand and he said, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. I found in some research that it was customary for Hebrew mothers to speak blessings over their children. The mothers tenderly saying to their children, get up, wake up. God incarnate is speaking over this little girl. Daughter, get up. 
This miracle shows Jesus' authority over death. It also illustrates later Christian teaching about death. It is a sleep from which we will one day awake when we hear the Savior's voice. At, the, at that, she was up and walking around. The girl was 12 years of age. They, of course, were all beside themselves with joy. Resurrection has taken place. Jesus defeated death. 2 Timothy 1.10 But it has not been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has destroyed death and who has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And verse 43, he gave them strict orders that no one was to know what had taken place in that room. Then he said, give her something to eat. So we all know the story of Jairus. Since early years of Sunday school and Bible school and training union, Jairus was one of the rulers of the Jewish synagogue whose daughter was very ill and was now at the point of death. His only daughter relative to God's only son, and she was 12 years of age. Last week, we covered the number 12. Do you remember? There are multiple references to 12 in the Old Testament. It is symbolic of perfection and completion. In the New Testament, when Christ was beginning his early ministry, he chose how many? 12 disciples, his apostles, whom he endowed with special powers and responsibilities to govern his church. The book of Revelation also presents 12 foundations of the heavenly Jerusalem, 12 gates, 12 pearls, 12 angels, all of which symbolize the perfection of heaven. So back to our story, Jairus heard that Jesus was near and went to him and was falling down before him, which I found incredible. A ruler of the Jewish synagogue was kneeling before Jesus and implored him to come because his daughter was comatose. In Matthew 9, 18, her father says she is already dead. Jesus went to her even though others mocked him, saying it was too late. When he saw her body, he took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumi, little girl, I say to you, arise. Jesus was not just a miracle worker, but a practical and kindly man. He took her par told her parents to give her something to eat because she had not eaten for some time and was probably hungry. Twelve-year-olds are generally always hungry. People often forget that Jesus was from an ordinary rural, rural community, and he healed people, but he also cared about their well-being. Jesus' healing gives us the gift of eternal life. I'm the resurrection and the life, he says in John 11, 25 and 26. When Jesus calls us to arise, we can come to him and be saved. Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins. He shed his blood also for our sins so that we could be cleansed. Just as Jesus rose physically from the dead, and ascended back to heaven, he is seated there now at the right hand of God. The story has what seems like a strange addendum. Jesus told the people who were present not to talk about it with others, a faint hope in the circumstances. Some might wonder why. At this stage of his ministry, Jesus was attracting more attention than he wanted. Attention meant crowds, and crowd can mean danger, if the authority saw Jesus as a potential rebel against the authority of the Jewish or the Roman governors. Interwoven with the story of Jairus' daughter is the woman who touched Jesus' garment. This woman's encounter with Jesus is written in Mark and Matthew and Luke. Jesus practiced the ministry touch, touching the untouchables, and they also touched him, Mark 5, 25 through 34. Among these things, consider defiling, which disqualified people for the rituals of religion, was an issue of blood. Excessive blood flow made the woman ceremonially unclean. Any furniture she touched was unclean. 
if other people touched anything she has touched, they would be unclean. And it shows us that Jesus did not neglect the needs of a lowly woman to impress an influential religious leader. Jairus, who had asked Jesus to come to his daughter who was near death. In a patriarchal society, this woman was very alone. No one would have wanted to be around her. She couldn't go out in public. She couldn't be hugged by her family. Twelve years. She had the flow of blood for twelve years. That's a long time to be quarantined from all people. Unable to find anyone to heal her, she found faith in a crowd to force her way up to Jesus, approaching him from behind in order to remain inconspicuous and simply touched his garment. When she did this, two things happened. The flow of blood stopped and she was discovered. What is the significance of the woman touching the hem of his garment? We have Americanized what is really amazing here. In the Old Testament, Numbers 15, 37 through 41, the Jews were commanded to put tassels on their coats that contained a blue cord. The Jews were commanded to eat or not eat certain foods in order for them to be set apart, sanctified. These are God's particular people. God carved out the Jews to be distinctive. The Talmud scribes wearing of a tallit, which is an article of clothing that had special twined and knotted fringes known as zazit attached to its four corners. The cloth part is known as the baguette and it's usually made from linen or wool, which signifies a connection to the priesthood. We may not be called to be a priest, but we are called to share the good news. We are disciples. Our roles, however, can be vastly different as a disciple. So the wool, of course, is from a sheep and a lamb, which testifies of the connection to the sacrificial lamb sig signifying atonement. The tassel, the zazit, is made of four strands, which must be made with intent. The blue cord that is included in the tassel is a reminder of royalty. The dye is made from Mediterranean snails and is very expensive. Only the wealthy could afford this very expensive blue dyed cord made from the Mediterranean snails. Blue is also a reminder of the sky or heaven or God. The zazit were tied in specific patterns with the required number of knots and identification and was sometimes a signature of a certain family, as in Luke 20, 45 through 47. The zazit were also used to seal or provide authority to documents. In the Old Testament, when Saul pursued David to kill him, do you remember one night David snuck into a cave where Saul was sleeping and cut off one of the zazit from Saul's garment? The next morning, Saul was calling out to David that he was going to come and kill him. And David answered back and said that he could have killed Saul in his sleep. And the proof was that David held up Saul's sazit as a sign that he had taken Saul's authority. The sazit also signifies priestly authority, power. It's a reminder of personal holiness. So at the same moment that the lady touched the tassel of his garment, Jesus felt the discharge of energy from him. And he turned and asked, who touched him? The disciples tried to brush aside the question, protesting that in such a crowd, no individual could be singled out. Jesus pressed his inquiry, and the woman came and trembled at his feet. She explained her reason and declared amid the crowd what blessings had come to her in Luke 8:47, Jesus treated her as having worth, not rebuking her for what the Levitical code of holiness would have considered defiling him in Leviticus 15, 19 through 25. 
Jesus did not have to acknowledge the woman. Her act of faith to touch the hem of her garment was enough to heal her. It seems that he wanted to look her in the eyes, not yell at her for bothering him, but to see the beautiful, genuine faith emanating from her heart. He wanted to acknowledge that she did not have to suffer anymore. She was free. So ask and keep on asking with the faith and determination of the woman in this story. As we saw previously, Naomi kept asking God, where was he through all her troubles? God answered in a big way, restoring her security when Ruth bore Obed to become Ruth's male heir and continue the Elimelech family line. And she was an ancestor in the lineage of Jesus. Jesus looked at this woman and comforted her of any sense of guilt for her seemingly rash act. He lifted her up and called her daughter. Pursuant to Levitical law, it would have been impermissible for a woman to even touch the tzitzit of only family members or her husband or her son. Jesus calls her daughter in order to dismiss any hint of impropriety. The woman with the issue of blood knew of these traditions, which should explain why she taught to touch the hem or the wings of Jesus' prayer garment. The same word is used in Numbers 15:38. Speak to the Israelites and say to them throughout the generations to come, you are to make tassels on the corners of your garments with a blue cord on each tassel. And corner is used in Malachi 4:2 in place of the word wings. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. In Numbers 15, 38, the word translated border or corner is a Hebrew word which can also be translated wings, as in some 76 times in the Bible. For this reason, the corners of the prayer shawl are often called wings. Each tzitzit consists of five double knots and eight threads and a total of 13 elements. Uh, there was also a lot of research that I just couldn't get through. There's <coughs> practically a whole book about the significance of the tassels. So what happened when this woman touched Jesus' garment? There was a transfer of Jesus' power and authority and status and purity. She knows his th true identity. We cannot heal ourselves by anything that we can humanly do. In order to be saved, we must know who Jesus is. Jesus told her that her faith saved her. He gave her his love and sent her away. Do you think this woman became a disciple that day after her healing and cleansing? I think so. I think she had a pretty great return to her family and her position in life. So let's compare and contrast these two children of God in these two stories, these two women whose stories overlap and they were almost in competition for Jesus's attention. So one was an innocent child and the other was a grown woman. One was a favored daughter of a very important man she was born into a wealthy family of status and well-known in the community. And she was free to go worship and be out in public. The woman with an issue of blood was considered unclean and was shunned, not only by the community, but by her family and her friends, if she even had any. Because of her impurity, she was unable to worship or be out in public. Her life was a shame. So... Were these two so very different women even a little bit similar? The answer is yes. Both are in need of the same thing, Jesus' healing power. Rise up, daughter. Jesus is calling us to reach out and meet him where we are. Jesus calls women to be courageous and step out into the light, to stop living in fear and hiding our flaws. The Bible tells us that fear is not from God. Fear is from the devil. For God gives us a spirit 
not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. 1 Timothy 1.7 Just as the woman who touched the hem of Jesus' garment, reaching out and trusting Jesus with our whole story, our sins, our failures, to be confident about who we are through Jesus' sacrifice for us. As disciples, we need to seek out the marginalized of society, the lonely and forgotten hearts, and bring them back to healing and restoration where they can find God's family and acceptance in their lives. So here we are again at the close of this portion of our study. And I hope you're finding some different perspectives from what uh, are, are some familiar Bible stories. Naomi and Ruth from the book of Ruth in the Old Testament and some of the women that Jesus has encountered in the New Testament of which there are many more. So I want to once again invite you to come see us at First Baptist Lancaster where we are meeting on Sunday mornings at 10, 1030 for worship and we are looking forward to when we are able to resume meeting at Holy Grounds and for Sunday Bible study. So one more thing before closing, would you pray with me? Today I pray in Jesus' name that he speaks over you Talitha Kumi, little girl, I say to you, arise, rise up, and reach out, and let Jesus acknowledge you. I pray that your life is truly blessed when you hear and obey his word. And whether you're a man or a woman, our ultimate purpose in life is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Our Father, who created Eve to be an image bearer and an azer, a strong helper, our Father, we are daughters of Eve, and you made us Azers. It was you who created the powerful union that is essential for men and women to face the challenges of the world together in the battle for God's kingdom. As image bearer, the Bible tells us that our chief purpose is to love the Lord our God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. Our Father, go with us, guiding us, protecting us today and every day. I pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. He spoke like a song, though lifeless and cold. At once I became strong.